Okay, I hope I did this right. Let's do that. Ah, no, I need to be sitting here. Okay. Done. Yay, I think I did it. Uh, okay, cool. Hello, everyone. Um, I am learning how to use OBS, so um, if this looks weird, don't blame me. Blame OBS. Because I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, you can hear me, so that's good. I'm going to turn the volume down on this iPad. Where is the thing? Okay. Um, I have my iPad so I can, like, actually see you guys in the chat room and see what you're doing. Um, if you're new here, welcome to tomorrow. This is Letting Off Steam. This is, like, our um, super casual, um, like, talk to you guys, talk about cool space stuff kind of show. Um, I have learned how to make like cool graphics in OBS work for once so that's nice. Um, this is at a really weird time uh, because all of our letting off steam or LOS shows are pretty much randomized like so anyone around the world has a chance to be able to participate because our regular interview um, shows that are live tend to be you know at a time when like maybe the US and Canada are awake but if you're like in Australia or New Zealand like I am right now um, it's at like 3 a.m. and it's really hard to like actually wake up and participate. So these are fun shows where you can just chat to me. Um, hi Johnny Cheese, hi Andy Cowley. Um, thank you for tuning in. Uh, thank you for being awake at this time. Um, I don't know where you guys are located, but yeah, it means a lot that you guys are tuning in and we're gonna have some fun. So there we go, it's interactive, it's random. The third thing that all our letting off Steam shows are is somehow related to steam so um you can see here i've got planet hunters test up and uh we're actually we're gonna go and uh hunt some exoplanets uh that are traveling around stars um miko hello from finland welcome we're gonna hunt some planets um this is exactly what i mean um, miko says that you know during the daytime in finland you don't really get a notification that tomorrow is live because like we don't usually go live at daytime in finland um but again, um, that's another reason why you should hit subscribe and hit the bell because then you will get a notification on your phone or whatever that we are live. And then you won't miss cool um, things like this where we're going to go and hunt for exoplanets. Uh, so Planet Hunters uh, is uh, part of the Zooniverse.org kind of organization. They do a bunch of citizen science projects. Um, Planet Hunters is one of my favorites because it uses data from tests um, and it makes you look at the data and then you can be like, oh, hey, like there's a little dip there where a planet has like gone across the sun and made the light that the telescope received like actually gets less because the planet's blocking some of the light. And so like if you keep doing that and they keep finding patterns, um, then like you can find planets. And the cool thing is, hello, Peter Quinn and hello, Conceptual Man. Um, the cool thing is if enough people like see the same pattern on the same star and the same lot of data, um, they'll actually like try and confirm that that's actually a planet and if it gets published that it is a planet then like your name gets added on the piece of paper like like gets put in a scientific journal saying like you guys found a planet so uh, that'd be pretty cool to me so it's pretty easy to do like just go to the um, website you can see the website here um, uh, in my browser bar and then uh, what you want to do like there's a little tutorial you can take where they explain like what they're looking for but basically um, all these dots here are like uh, measurements of the brightness of the star that the, that the telescope has measured. Sometimes there's weird gaps in this data, um, you just ignore that. Um, but sometimes like there's a gap because the telescope will be like uh, transmitting its data back to Earth instead of just storing it on its hard drive and that can like mess with the signals. So um, these kind of gaps are kind of normal, don't worry about them. Um, but uh, what you're looking for is kind of uh, little dips. So I would say like this is a dip here. It's easier to just like get in there and try and do it um, because those data points are like way lower than like the rest of the data. I have no idea whether you can see my cursor. Hopefully I'm not just like randomly pointing to things that you can't even see. Um, and then maybe like that one, but then also I don't know. So like <laughs> here's the thing, because this is like real data, I start to freak out and be like, oh my God, what if I do it wrong? But you know what? Screw it. Like this, they, they send the same images to like multiple people. So if you get it wrong and someone else like is like, oh, I don't think that looks like a planet transit, then like they'll work it out and you'll be fine. So, um, hunting planets is pretty stupid. How do you even plan to catch one? Uh, well, I think I'm too little to catch a planet, so that that's not going to be a thing. But I'm I can hunt one like with my brain power. Um, yeah, <laughs> I have no idea. 
Hello from the U.S. Um, have a child. I don't know why you're still awake. Isn't it like 3 a.m. right now in the U.S.? Um, yeah, cool. So let's let's see. Uh, if we click done here, then it'll tell me either I did it right or I did it wrong. So we'll see. Oh my goodness, I did it right! Okay, cool. Um, so uh, mixed into some of this actual data from tests, uh, they uh, they need to like validate their data and validate that, that this process of citizen science of allowing anyone around the world that has an internet connection to like actually do science here. Um, what they do is they get their like a supercomputer or whatever, and they make it do a simulation if if like if there was a planet this big going around a star of this much brightness, what would the data look like? And so they they do like fake um, data plots, and then they give them to us to like look at and see if we can actually spot when the planet was going across in the simulation. So that's a kind of way to verify and test that what, what they're actually doing is legit and might actually be a planet. So, because, you know, maybe there's, like, just something... You never know if, like, the telescope itself is adding weirdness into the data or anything like that. So you have to do a bunch of different tests to, to see that you're getting the right... Um, you're drawing the right con conclusions from the data. So that's pretty cool. Hello, Harry Stranger from Australia. Thank you for being a member. Um, 9.30 a.m. over here. Yeah, right now I'm in New Zealand. It is um, 8.40 p.m. at night, so... Uh, hello, Hank Sumner, and uh, hello, the moon is square. Thanks for joining. Um, if you guys want to, like, join in and, like, get Planet Hunters up on your own browser and, like, we can see how many planets and stuff we do, that'd be pretty cool. Um, so I'm going to keep going here. Oh, this is a fantastic example. So, uh, like, here's a transit, and here's a transit, and that one there, and probably this one here as well. Um, they also tend to be pretty evenly spaced because, like, planets go around their star at, you know, the same speed. Well, that well, that's incorrect. It takes the same um, like amount of time for the planet to reach the same spot in its orbit, where like the telescope is here, um, and then the the distant star is here, and then like the planet has to go through in the middle. That will happen at a regular um, basis. So these tend to be quite evenly spaced, and that's kind of how you can tell that like that one, like right here, is probably not um, a planet transit because it doesn't like match the spacing of the other ones, so you can like, oh, oh no, can I, oh no, I can't clear it, I've messed everything up. Oh, there, okay, cool, nobody panic, totally wasn't panicking. Turn off the light behind you, it's glaringly bright, hello from Serbia. Oh, should I like, yeah, I, okay, I'm gonna turn that light off. And now I'm probably like weirdly lit, so. Okay, you guys are going to just have to tell me whether this is, like, better or worse. Oh, I think it's better. Okay, cool. All right, so let's see. Did I, like, correctly get a transit here? All right, so I'm doing pretty well. It's pretty good. Um, yeah, we need some chat moderators, apparently. Cool. I don't know if anyone is awake that is our normal chat moderators, so. You know what? I can, no, can I do, no, I'm not going to. Um, so yeah, keep classifying and let's find some planets. Okay, sometimes there's like this weird like data pattern here, like you can see like so many little dips happening. Um, yeah, when when these ones happen, I don't know what's going on and I don't want to like mess it up, so I just like don't click anything and I go to the next one. Better? Awesome. Cool. I'm glad that it's better for you guys. Um, I can't really see any, like, transits happening here, so let's just click next. Sometimes I like to, oh, this is awesome. Uh, sometimes I like to just, like, listen to music and do this, to, like, just chill out. Because, you know, like, so many people just sit in front of the TV to, like, make themselves relax. But if you're going to just be, like, lazing around, not doing anything that takes too much energy, like, why not? take that time and give that to citizen science and help, you know, do some data processing on things that can have some pretty cool um, outcomes. Like uh, the citizen science projects that are on Zooniverse, they aren't like all of them are space related. Some of them are like, one I used to do was with penguins and they would just have like um, wildlife cameras out set in like remote areas that would just like take pictures. And then um, because they know exactly the location of their cameras, um, they would get you to like, um, just like highlight whenever there was like a penguin in the image and like how many and then they can like from that they can tell like where the penguins are going where they're migrating where they're nesting um, and like monitor the population numbers as well which I thought was pretty cool 
Um, 2.50 a.m. Oh, my goodness. Heather, what are you doing? Why are you still awake at 2.50 in the morning? Not that I can talk because um, last night I was up till, like, 2 a.m., which was bad because, like, it, my day is, like, pretty much gone and I don't get that much sleep. So but what happened is that the, the today, instead, I got up at, like, 1 p.m. because I'd stayed up till, like, 2 in the morning. So... Oh no, I missed one? Oh dear, how did I miss one? Oops, I got distracted then and then I missed one. Oh, this is a really good one too. Um, the cool thing about Planet Hunters is like, see how sometimes there's that pop-up and it would be like, yeah, you did it right or you did it wrong or whatever. That's the simulated data that I was talking about. Um, but if like, they only give you that little pop-up if it was a simulation that you were classifying. Um, if I was to, like, do this one and I didn't get a pop-up, that meant that it was, like, real data from Tess and, like, I found a for realsies planet. So, like, that's cool. And hopefully this is, like, a for realsies one and not a simulation, but, oh, it's like, what? Oh, yeah. Okay, so this one's interesting. Oh, Trouble Cuba. Hi, I'm you here. Can you briefly explain what your task is and how I can get involved in this? Um, so Trouble Cuba, hi, welcome to tomorrow. Um, we're just, like pretty much just having fun trying to find planets. So if you want to get involved, um, you can see at the top of the screen, hopefully if it's not cut off, yeah, you can see like a, a URL there, zooniverse.org slash project slash Nora dash dot dash eyes. Now, you can just go to zooniverse.org and type in Planet Hunters. You get this up in your browser and then you're just looking, like there's a tutorial, but you're just looking for like dips um, in, in like the pattern on the graph. And those dips can be when a planet is moving in front of a star and it like lowers the brightness of the star and then that's how we can find planets outside our solar system. So 11.44 a.m. Johnny Cheese. Well, I'm glad that you're nice and awake and having a lovely Tuesday or Monday. I'm not sure what date it is where you are there. Monday, I think. Um, Colton! Hello, Colton! Uh, Darko FC is here as well. Hello, Darko. Um, welcome to our Letting Off Steam. We're trying to find some planets. But like, look, look at this simulated data here. Like I was not paying attention enough to like notice these little dips that you can like see where all the red bars are. But like now that it, they pointed out to me, it, it's kind of clear. But like some of those are like still so close to like the the normal data that it's getting. Like how would you even see that that's a pattern? Like, okay, yeah, they're like evenly spaced, but ah, it's so crazy. Well, this is why they test, right? They want to see, like, if they're, if that simulation there that was really hard to see, maybe that was a really tiny planet going in front of, like, a big star. And so they'll know from that that this kind of method of um, classifying isn't great for that kind of situation where it's a teeny tiny planet, huge star. Like, maybe what we're doing here it tends to find more um, bigger exoplanets um, rather than kind of Earth-sized ones. But... Um, yeah, that's, that's why they test, and that's why I'm sitting here and finding planets. It's pretty cool. Looking for a heartbeat. That's a really great way to describe it, Peter Quinn. Yeah. Awesome, Trouble Cuba. I'm glad you're going to give it a go. I mean, you know, if you've got nothing else to do, why not help humanity find some planets? Plus, you know, you get your name on the scientific paper, which is pretty cool. So This one is weird to me because, like, they're not evenly spaced, but maybe that means there's like more than one planet going around this star. Like, I don't know, it's really weird. So like, yeah, some of them are evenly spaced and some aren't. That's so weird. I don't understand. It's probably gonna yell at me when I click done, so. Uh, Colton, so we're classifying data to hopefully feed to an artificial intelligence later. Um, I don't know exactly how it goes from doing this to like finding planets. Like I'm not sure if a human sits here in front of it and like maybe um maybe they give the same kind of data to like multiple people and then if like there's a pattern there, um it'll be like, Oh, star fifty or forty two, everyone's saying it has a planet around it, so like the test science team gets um like a notification being like you guys should check Planet 42. Seems like a great candidate. Like, I don't, there's a disconnect there. It doesn't tell me what happens to this data after this. All I know is, um, yeah. oh, I missed one? Oh, were there two? That was two? Oh, man. See, this is like, 
it just keeps it's the gift that keeps on giving it's the science that just keeps getting excited whoa look at this one! Oh my goodness I, I didn't even know like how a star could be like doing this does that mean it's like a pulsar that's like variable in its brightness I didn't even know guys I'm not an astronomer my background's molecular biology so this is like above me um if you guys have any ideas of why this looks so cool like oh my goodness um uh, for a cap, I did this for KBOs, Kuiper Belt Objects. Oh, that's really cool. Um, Peter Quinn, it could be life, uh, but not as we know it. Huh. That'd be cool. Imagine if, like, wasn't there some star, like, Tabby's star or something, and it, it, like, light curve was just all over the place, and everyone was like, it's aliens. Maybe this is aliens. It's probably not aliens. Don't quote me there. Um, I don't know what to do here, so I'm just going to go to the next one. Imagine if, like, all the citizens of tomorrow, we have, like, 55,000 subscribers. Imagine if, like, everybody hunted for planets, like, just, like, 10 minutes a week. Like, how many planets we could find. That would be pretty cool. Um, I don't think there's a planet there. Oh, oh, whoa, this is kind of cool. Okay, so I'm going to do all the easy ones first. That one and that one. Also, if you guys, like, see planets that I'm, like, missing, um... Feel free to just be like, hey, you missed one, and then, yeah. Although I suppose with all the lag and latency, I'm probably not going to see your message by the time I need to, like, click done. Um, is it a CFID? Like a CFID variable? Yeah, it might be. Or a massive storm or sunspot? Yeah, day 14. Um, yeah, probably. Going by like the spacing of these, it's probably one like right in here, but you know, we miss it because of the, the data drop out there. But that's okay because we can get all the other potential planets that are here. Like this one and this one. And is it like two or is that just like gonna go down? Oh, who knows? This is why it's the scientist's job to find these out. You know what? Why don't I just do them as one like this? Or is it... no, that's probably wrong. Okay, we'll do this instead. I don't know what I'm doing, guys. I'm just like doing some science. I also have a cup of tea. It's jasmine green tea. Small star, big planet. Yeah, potentially conceptual man. That's a mouthful. Potentially conceptual man. Um, Colton has a 27 second delay from me. I apologize for the latency. Um, right now I am 40 minutes drive from the nearest uh, town in New Zealand, the nearest grocery store. But I am on the beach, um, but right now I can't see the beach because it's like 8.50 at night. Um, just 10 minutes old news. Whoa! Chandrayaan 2, Vikram is in one piece and they can make contact with it? That's amazing! Congratulations, India! I saw the news that um, the lander might not have crashed. And, you know, when you have like Twitter news or people are like, yeah, it didn't crash, it's fine, but nothing from Israel, like, you, you're a bit skeptical. But if ISRO is confirmed, like, that's that's amazing. That is an awesome achievement for India. That's perfect. Wow. Yeah, everyone's getting all excited. Um, I'm excited too. Um, I was really, really excited to, I mean, I, I missed the, the like, web stream live um, of what they were doing because I think it was when I was sleeping. But, um, yeah, so proud of India. That's an amazing, amazing accomplishment. Man, Israel's is just kicking gold, like Mars Orbiter, and now they're on the moon. Maybe I should just, like, go and visit, it, like, Israel and get a bunch of people on the show. That'd be cool. Uh, I've tried a lot, actually, to get people from Israel, like, um, on our show, but the time zone's the problem. It's, like, 3, 4, and 5 in the morning for them on, like, a Sunday. Um, who's going to, like, if... If I don't know you personally, like a lot of my friends from like Australia, New Zealand, Japan um, <laughs> come on the show at like 3 a.m. because they're my friends. And I'm like, please, please just like wake up early and, and do an interview for us. But when it's people like you don't know, like you just reach out to Israel and be like, hey, can someone like do an interview? And they see it's 3 a.m. They're like, no, no, sorry. Make it a different time or like we're not going to not going to do it, which is totally fair. So. Um. Did it lose contact and tumble? Yeah, I want to know that too. I want to know what happened. That's awesome. Hooray for India. Um, I don't know what the source is of that information that you have, but yeah, if it's from, sorry, that's awesome. 
All right, back to planet hunting, getting distracted. I nearly missed this one here. A few times I've actually missed um, some uh, little dips because of the, um, what do you call it? The access labels. So that's been annoying. Oh, okay. All right, I see what I did. So those two are separate and those other red ones are separate too. I should have marked them separately apparently. Or they're not, wait, maybe they're not transits. Oh, I don't know. This is for the scientists to work out, not me. I'm just here finding patterns. I say it like as if I'm not a scientist. I am trained in science, but yeah, not in this, in molecular biology. Uh, so the news came from Times of India and First Post, which means I'm going to temper my excitement until I get something from, like, ISRO itself. Uh, it crashed, they can contact it, but what use would that be? Uh, I think it would be useful. Goddess of the Oaks Gourd Peace. Cool name, by the way. Um, I think that would be useful because, like, if they're contacting it and getting, like, you know, a signal back, then it kind of crashed that badly because its electronics are still working and its like power generation systems are still working. So um, to even be able to successfully land something on the moon is incredibly hard. Like we just saw Space IL, um, the Israeli former Google Lunar X Prize team, they tried to land their uh, moon mission and they got within, you know, a few kilometers and then their engine cut out and it like totally crashed. So actually landing something on the moon is a really huge achievement. It was the whole reason that Google and XPRIZE was created. Whoa, look at this light curve. Oh man, oh, science is so cool. Okay, so this is definitely a thing. And this one I think is a thing. And But then I think this one is also a thing. And maybe here, but I don't know. And then like, why is it going up here? Oh man, you guys, this is just, blows my mind that we have all this data like go NASA and go test this is really cool this is my first time what do I click on hello Donna H um, thank you for joining me if you would also like to classify planets um, you can go to uh, zooniverse.org and type in planet hunters and then you can like play along with me we're looking for little dips um, in in the patterns that you can see here um, and those little dips can be stars um, we're basically like looking at data that measures brightness from a star and every time a planet goes in front of that star that's really far away it makes the brightness go down in a little dip um, that's what we're trying to mark on the graphs here colton okay i'm starting to question the, this data what is it at 14 that it just drops completely um so colton those um complete um gaps in the data uh, a lot of them uh, from the tutorial that I did, uh, it, it might be because when Tess is uh, returning its data back to like Earth, when it's downlinking, it can't measure. Well, it can measure still at the same time, but like that data is, tends to be quite sketchy, so they just cut that out um, because like one part of it is trying to keep its antenna pointed at Earth to send back the data, and then the telescope parts are trying to stay really still because you have, I mean. If a star is really far away, you got to like keep still, otherwise everything's going to get blurry. Maybe that's why some of those curves are like crazy like that, because maybe the spacecraft like wasn't pointing precisely where it needed to be. It's like me when I'm videotaping something and I have like super shaky hands and then, you know, the video is poor quality <laughs> because I have shaky cam. So, yeah. Hello, Karthik Naren. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Allison. Um, nice to see you here. We're, we're hunting for planets, um, and I'm also just chatting to you guys. So, uh, people in the chat are talking about how the Indian rover, Vikram, uh, sorry, Indian lander Vikram, uh, potentially is a successful mission, which is really, really cool. There's also a rover on board. Um, I'm going to mispronounce the name, so I don't want to mispronounce it. It starts with the letter P. Um, and that's actually inside the lander as well. So if they're able to establish contact, um, it's going to actually drive down a ramp and go out and explore the moon, which is going to be so amazing. I can't wait until, like, imagine, like, five years from now, uh, the first people that go back to the moon, um, maybe they land at the South Pole as well, and, like, they walk over, kind of like Mark, Mark Watney in the, in the Martian, and they, like, go and see the Vikram lander, and they're like, good job, little lander, you, you did good. <laughs> oh, that would be so sweet. 
is that a transition at 14? Um, the bottom axis here, guys, is days as well. So you can see, you know, a mission like Tess, um, you're not just kind of looking at the star once and that's it. Like, it, the, they're looking at it like, I guess Tess does like a pattern in the sky. It goes and, and sweeps across a certain area of, this, of the sky and then goes back and repeats that sweep again so that this data has a chance to build up over days. Um, Karthik, it can be contacted but can't do science. Well, I mean, even if it can't do science, at least it landed successfully. And, you know, engineers are pretty smart. Scientists are pretty smart. A lot of times, you know, another great example of a mission that kind of went wrong but still got to do some really cool science, um, the Galileo probe to Jupiter, it had two antennas on it. So it had, like, a giant, like, kind of dish antenna that you probably used to when you think of the uh, antenna on a spacecraft. And that was a high gain antenna that had the ability to send really high data rates, um, high bandwidth back to Earth to you know, be able to send photos uh, really, really quickly and, and all that scientific data. But it was meant to actually deploy out. And um, one of the pins that held the, like one of the arms of, of the um, antenna's parabola to like extend out got stuck. And no matter what they could do, they could not fully deploy it. So the antenna was basically useless. They had a, another um, low power antenna uh, on board that was just meant for like, you know, phone home, are you still okay during the um, dormancy mode while you're like in hibernation. Um, and that ended up being used as the main antenna. I mean, all of the scientific data of Galileo had to go through that teeny tiny antenna and it was so slow, but they managed to do it because, you know, when you're in these challenging situations, you kind of just figure it out. Like, so maybe that's what ISRO will do. They'll just figure out how to operate this lander um, with whatever they have available to them. Um, it hard landed near the target and is currently tilted according to uh, image from a, the orbiter. Um, it's in one piece, but it tilted and very hard landing, um, but it's in a single piece and not broken into pieces. Cool. Well, I mean, if it's in a single piece, then and maybe even if the lander is like not working, maybe the rover can still work because they're kind of like separate. Like the, I think the rover had solar panels on it. So they can somehow contact the rover and can be like, hey, little rover, just like drive out because um, uh, it's on. it needs to be on a ramp. Uh, the ramp is like uh, on the side of the spacecraft uh, and then the it'll just deploy. Like the wall will come out and become the ramp and then the rover would like drive down. So... <laughs> Maybe they could be like, hey, Rover, just like drive forward at maximum speed. And like they can like push the wall out so it falls down and becomes a ramp. And then the little Rover can go out. And that, I think that would be pretty cool. Now, the South Pole is cursed. Um, Parikshit Vernma? Maybe it is cursed. But you know what? All curses have an end uh, expiry date, don't they? So everyone thought Mars was cursed for a long time. But look at us now. Like... Curiosity landed, Insights there, Mars 2020 is about to go there. So maybe the curse is broken. Uh, Allison, they developed the JPEG format for the pics they sent back. Oh, in relation to Galileo? Oh, wow. I never knew it. Like something I use all the time on the internet, you know, like saving images and sending images is something from space flight. That's awesome. Um, I'm going to click done here because I don't know any more planets on that data. Oh, this one's just messy data everywhere, so I'm just going to click done. Same with this one. It's so hard because like, if, like, all of the, like, data points are all kind of dispersed like that, it's, like, hard to see any um, differences, you know? Yeah, I don't think there's a planet there. Maybe this and this, but, like, I'm not sure, so I don't want to, like, Classify it. Um, Burndy. Oh, damn, that's a nice new overlay. <gasps> Thank you for noticing. So this is my first time using OBS and literally the last, like, two hours. I'm sitting in, like, Photoshop open here and then I have OBS open here and I'm like, how do I do a simple Luma key? I don't understand. Because <laughs> I'm so used to using, like, Blackmagic products for, like, you know, like, proper switching and stuff. Um, and... and like that is just you know press these buttons here and there you go and like everything works and here's all your different layers and so with OBS I'm like I don't I don't, I don't know what I'm doing it's gonna be like two hours to figure it out and then oh 
but I did it. So I'm glad you like it because I just spent like two hours designing that. So totally worth it. Um, it kind of reminds me of like, it's going to sound weird, but Swoopy thing I did reminds me of like Starship and like, you know what, SpaceX, how there's like that pedestrian um, walkway bridge. I'm getting those kind of vibes out of my design and I don't know why. Um, hope NASA astronauts put the lander in the correct position in 2024. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, Parrot sheet. Uh, if they land upside down, then they're probably being driven by Australians because, you know, the land of upside down. So, yeah. Um, so it landed, uh, Knurps Apollo 213. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Sorry. Uh, so it landed without any contact with Earth, but it made a hard landing. The lander is now tilted and you can't do any experiments. Um, well, I'm sure you could figure out something, like, if, if they're able to contact it and also receive signals back, then, you know, they have radio where they're able to, like, disperse radio waves from the spacecraft. So, you know, maybe you could do some, like, radio science or, like, um, like maybe measuring, um, I don't know. I don't know enough about radio science. But maybe you could, like, transmit something from the lander and then, like, the orbiter, like, it could bounce off some, like, rocks or something and then the orbiter could, like, monitor that. I, I don't know. I'm trying to be a, like a radar scientist here, guys, and I don't know what I'm talking about. You know, it's like SAR. Everyone's talking about synthet synthetic aperture radar now. Like, maybe they could do that. I have no idea. Um, the lander and rover only have 14 days before temperature and radiation takes it down. Oh, well, guess it's a race against time then. Peter Quinn, are you on holidays or vacation in New Zealand or some sort of work thing? Um, so I came here in New Zealand because... It's isolated and it's in the middle of nowhere and I'm actually writing a book of which my Patreon for that will release um, sometime this week. So watch my Twitter and social medias for that if you're interested. I'm actually writing a book. Uh, the book is going to be about how um, high performing organizations can avoid um, disasters and accidents. I don't think that we should fear failure, but I think that we shouldn't also sweep it under the rug. We should learn from those mistakes. Um, so I'm going to take a, a case study an example of a NASA funded mission I was involved with that ended in failure and uh, I want to take uh, lessons learned from that and kind of turn it into you know what are the things to look out for what are the warning signs what are the red flags um, how can management you know how can we make processes where people can like raise concerns and avoid having disasters happen or if a disaster does happen how do we make sure like that we're the most prepared or any kind of scenario or the most likely scenarios that might happen so that's going to be my book uh, about 5,000 words in um, and it's going to be quite an adventure the scope keeps creeping so I started with being like I'm just going to tell a story and then it ended in I'm going to do all this research now and change the world because of my book so we'll see how we go ah Burndy it's great blending well fits in perfectly with the whole tomorrow and SpaceX designs oh great I'm really glad you like it Hello from Australia, the Astronomical Research and Rocketry Organization. Whoa, well hello, um, the ARRO, I've actually never heard of you, and I'm Australian. Um, I am sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. I'm, I'm going to be at the Australian Space Research Organization, uh, sorry, Australian Space Research Conference, uh, ASRC, uh, in Adelaide from September 30th to October 2nd. So if you're going to be there, let me know, uh, tweet me, um, comment below, tell tomorrow. Um, I am going there for tomorrow to kind of get some ideas for news stories and guests um, to bring in our show. Um, the kind of Australia, New Zealand, Asia region has been doing a lot of cool stuff in space. Um, so I'm going there to learn what that cool stuff is and bring those cool people on so you guys can talk to them. Uh, any electron launches while you're there? Yes, Trouble Cuba. I actually got to photograph my first launch ever. So I, like, when I arrived in New Zealand, I didn't have any cameras or anything with me because I left them all in the States because I didn't intend on making videos. Like, this was supposed to be just, like, a sabbatical where I could also write my book. Um, uh, and then there was going to be a Rocket Lab launch, and, and I was like, you're kidding me, right? Like, I am not going to be in New Zealand. And by the way, I'm only three hours... Three, yeah, about three hours drive, two, three hours drive from the launch site. 
Um, and I was like, no way, I'm here, I need to go. So I like I drove down many times. Um, first of all, I drove down to figure out where to watch it from. Um, which reminds me, I am working on a video of the best top five places to watch a Rocket Lab Electron launch in New Zealand. So stay tuned for that. That's going to be a while though, because I have all the footage, but like, I just can't be bothered editing it because this laptop can't handle 4K editing. It's just so slow. So I'm waiting till I have a good computer. Um, so that video is coming and I was like, no way I'm going to miss the New Zealand launch. So I like drove down to find the spot. And then I drove down for the first launch attempt and then it cancelled and then I drove down for the next launch attempt. So I used like $200 worth in fuel. Um, yeah, hence the book Patreon. Um, so, but it was totally worth it. It was amazing. Um, I had no idea what I was doing for launch photography, but I came up with a nice amazing image. Um, I don't think I can show you guys because I, yeah, I think it's on Twitter anyway. Uh, Rocket Lab actually tweeted it out. So yeah, go check that out. So cool, um, totally worth it. If you are ever in New Zealand and get to watch Electron, please come out here and watch it. Like I was like, cry I was crying and I was jumping up and down and it was like one in the morning or midnight and it was really cold, but I was also trying not to jump and like shake my camera. And uh, just like, it did, the place I watched it from, um, because New Zealand, and you'll see in the top five launch site video, uh, there's like mountains in the way of the range so it lit and I knew it had lit because I was like watching the webcast and like then the glow comes but you still don't see anything and then the like, kind of glowy smoke and then all of a sudden like I thought the glowy smoke was bright and then like the engines come up and uh, you couldn't hear anything but that was okay um, but it was so bright and it just like it like, went up and then uh, there was a lot of cloud cover, which was quite annoying. So it like hit the clouds like four or five seconds after it took off. Um, but then all of a sudden, like, cause you can still see the glow and there was this break in the clouds and then like you could see it again. And it was like, right, like totally like really high up above me. And then, it, uh, and then you could see separation. And then like, oh man, it's just so cool. Like you need to go and see it. Um, step one, cover the mains panel. I don't understand what that means, Colton. Dallas Clark, why are Australians upside down and not New Zealanders? I, well, New Zealanders are upside down too. That's why Electron launches from here. It, it takes less energy because it just they just let it go when it falls off the earth. That's how that works. Um, it promised best place for it, Lisa, in the middle of nowhere. For writing the book? Uh, that, yeah, that's why I chose this place. No distractions. I haven't seen another human being in, it's got to be close to a month now, like in terms of face-to-face. -face. Um, yeah, when did Dallas go grocery shopping? That's been fun. It's like living on Mars, right? Because like so far from the grocery store, I had to just like plan out, you know, I didn't want to spend another $200 in fuel. So I was like, how do I make this food last and also buy food that lasts a long time? Turns out canned goods are amazing and I love them. Uh, so jealous. I've yet to see a rocket launch. Well, yeah, um, they are incredible. Even people that you know, aren't space fans, I would say if you had the ability to just like bring a friend who doesn't really care about space, like whatever, if they're able to see a rocket lab, uh, well, they don't have to see a rocket lab launch, but if they see any rocket launch in person, like it just has the ability to capture this innate sense of curiosity and wonder and amazement at the world that, wow, humans can actually do that. Like how cool is physics and math and engineering and uh, rockets are awesome. Ugh, my tea is starting to get cold. Oh, Colton was talking about the book and the mishap. Step one, cover the mains panel. Yeah, well, that, that's a kind of a chapter of the book. So, but that's not what this stream is about. Um, maybe in the future I will do a stream about my book because, you know, it is kind of space related. But we're here to, to look up planets, which I've not been doing because you all have been distracting me. So... Ah, I don't see any planets here. I'm going to click done. Oh, look at this data. This is cool. Except that there's no planets. But, I mean, it's still cool. It's still cool. Uh, yeah, no planets. There is a reason why food drives mostly ask for canned goods. Yeah, so when I was... Li see, I just said I'm not going to talk about the book, but whatever. Um, when I was living um, in the High Seas Project, we um, we didn't actually have a huge amount of canned goods, but we had these 
Well, I guess they are cans because they're in a can. We have these giant cans of freeze-dried stuff. So like freeze-dried fruits and freeze-dried meat and freeze-dried vegetables, um, which was kind of cool. Like the texture was weird, um, but all the flavor was there and like the nutrition is there. Um, and like the meat was just like, I guess it's just like having like dehydrated like ground beef kind of stuff. So like you just rehydrate it in water, like boil it in water for a bit. And then yeah, it would kind of just like come back to not quite normal. Like you knew it wasn't fresh like ground beef or whatever, but it was pretty darn tasty. Um, one of my favorite things was like the freeze dried like raspberries and strawberries. You just like pop in like freeze dried strawberry in your mouth and oh, delicious bursts of flavor. It was really, really yummy. Oh, Alison, I'll have to come over. Come over to New Zealand? Yeah, New Zealand's beautiful. It's why I'm here. It's why I picked like this area. Um, I mean, it's nighttime. I'd show you if I could, but totally like mountains on this side and then the beach behind me. And yeah, um, the, the driveway to get to this like little township area is like gravel roads, like cliff over one end and cliff over the other end and huge winds blowing you back and forth and dusty. And <laughs> one time I... <laughs> I don't know if I should be admitting to this, but one time I was driving and like maybe I was going like too fast. Like instead of going like 30 kilometers per hour, I was going 40 kilometers per hour. And like my back wheels like like kind of like flipped out and I like nearly hit a fence, but I didn't hit the fence. So, you know, it's fine. I didn't hit it. Transit at 11 and 23. Oh, you guys are so clever. I didn't even see that. I was going to skip this. One, two, three. Here? I don't think here matches up with the period. Like if if that if the one at day three was related to eleven and twenty-three, like it would be back like it would be a day one, which I don't think it is. My, oh hello Shark Tales. My mum lived in New Zealand when she was a little girl. Nice. New Zealand's amazing. Um I I don't see any planets here. We're gonna go next. And next, and next again. Okay, that's just some really, really weird data. I don't know what's going on there. That's really strange. Um, we're just gonna go next. This is what I do when I like don't know. I just, I would rather like not make a wild assumption. Uh, big storm is hitting me now. If I go poof, I lost power. Oh, Colton, be safe in the storm, man. Um, it's actually been storming here, like, all of this week. And luckily, like, right now we seem to be okay. Um, but, like, all my firewood got wet, which has been sad for me because it's really cold here and there's no heating in this house. So I usually have to make a fire. But, yeah, the firewood, um firewood got wet like not the main store of firewood but like all the stuff that I had broken down into like um like kindling Ugh, so yeah no fire for me it's flares huh yeah stay safe Colton uh Starting to wrap up stuff for today when I saw there was going to be an LOS. Well, I'm glad you stayed awake, Colton, because uh, this is fun. I like looking for planets, especially when you guys tell me, like, you're missing one. What are you doing? Why aren't you clicking on the transits? Why are you talking instead of actually doing the science, Lisa? Whoa, look at that data. Oh, my goodness. You know what this looks like? This one kind of looks like, um, so, you know, with, like, radio, like, voice, um, voice signals over radio and how, like, they... Uh, especially with like uh, going back to my physics classes, um, AM modulation uh, like changes the the amplitude to like put the voice wave on top of the carrier wave. That is what this looks like. Imagine if like an alien civilization um, just like had some ability to like change the um, the brightness of like their star, or maybe like they had a fake star and they're using it to communicate with other aliens, and they change the brightness like by like amplitude uh, modulation to like put a voice signal onto like the brightness of the star oh man that'd be so cool this is the greatest plot for like a novel although it kind of reminds me of the plot of um there's a, a audio um drama 
podcast that I listen to called Wolf 359. Um, <laughs> and I haven't finished it, so no spoilers if you watch it, but like that, there's some weird stuff that happens with the star there. They're, they're on, on the Hephaestus station and they're orbiting uh, around a star and you just listen to like their story of like different characters and, and how they're interacting and how everyone's trying to kill each other and whatever. Um, and yeah, some weird stuff happens with their star. So, two fish kissing. Yeah, it kind of looks like two fish kissing. Oh my goodness. Roger C. Say data again. Am I saying data wrong? Oh man, Americans say data, don't they? Yeah, I, sorry. I, I grew up saying it one way and I now have to say it a different way and I forget. The longer I stay in the US though, the more my words change. And when I come back to the Southern Hemisphere, everybody's always like, you sound American, like, what's going on? Yeah. Uh, no threats, just a bit of water and a lot of lightning. Well, stay safe, Colton. Hopefully you've got some like lightning rods to direct the lightning away from important things. Um, does anyone see any planets here besides the two fish kissing? Um, I'm not seeing any planets, so I'm just going to click done. Wolf 359, isn't that Star Trek? Wolf 359, lest we forget the lives. The lives killed there. Oh, yeah. I see what you mean, Peter Quinn. The uh, Hephaestus station. Hephaestus? Hephaestus. Hephaestus. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Hephaestus? No, it's, he it's he Hephaestus. Yeah. Uh, it's a really good podcast. You guys should definitely check it out if you're into like spacey drama things. Um, I like it a lot. Hey, I just joined the stream after a long day of school. Welcome, uh, Takeaki Uemura. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're hunting for planets with tests, so um, you can see a bunch of like uh, data displayed here. Um, this one's like pretty dispersed, but sometimes it'll look like a nice kind of clear line with a few dips in it. We're looking for the dips because they uh, kind of show where a planet might be blocking out light from a star. All this data is coming from the, um, the TESS uh, satellite that NASA operates, the Transiting Exoplanet Satellite Survey. Um, but there's no planets in that example. It's a bad example. Ooh, do you think these might be planets, everybody? I don't know. I think it's too random to be able to say it's a planet. Uh, Dallas Clark, why not write a computer program to look for sine waves? If it's not sine waves, what is it that you're looking for in the data? Um, I don't know why they don't make a computer do it. Maybe... Um, the patterns aren't regular enough to be able to write a code to look for them. Um, I know one thing that humans are pretty good at is like looking at things that look like a jumbled mess and interpreting them to look like actual shapes. It's why we find it so easy to, to look at the clouds and be like, oh, that one looks like a unicorn, that one looks like a husky. Um, it's why people get pieces of toast and say that, you know, it looks like Jesus. Like, we just are, our brains are just really good at trying to make things seem more um, normal or relevant to us. So that includes like finding patterns in this data. Like it kind of almost looks like a face here between like four and eight. I, can you guys see my cursor? I don't even know if like that's a thing that you guys can see. I don't think you can see my cursor. That's so embarrassing. I've been like pointing to things with my cursor. You can't even see it. 23, 27, 15. Yeah, I was thinking that too. Like, you mean here and here? It could be, but like, this data goes down that low as well. Like, this is pretty variable. Okay. Uh, have you seen the uh, movie, movie Clark? Have you seen the movie? Do you mean movie? Therian, do you mean movie? Um, anyway, I have not seen the movie Clark, if that's what you're asking. Um, the Astro uh, Astronomical Research and Rocketry Organization. Have you heard of the Backyard Hunter Sun Zooniverse? It's a project to find Planet Nine. I personally enjoyed it. It's quite addictive. Um, yeah, you know, my plan is to actually work my way through the different projects that Zooniverse offers. I thought Planet Hunters would be a nice one to start with because it's pretty easy to explain. Um, at least I kind of understand the science behind it. You know, like planet moves in front of star, star gets dimmer, 
that's what we're looking for. Like, I can explain that. The other ones are not super, like, they don't know the science very well. So, um, yeah, I picked an easy one to start with. But I love doing these, like, casual, like, fun um, conversations with you guys. So I might end up doing, like, this on a semi-regular basis. We're trying to do these shows once a week. So maybe once a week I pick a different um, citizen science project and we all go and we all, like, go and look for planets one week, uh, exoplanets one week, and then the next week we look for planet nine. The next week we, like, classify penguins. Like, it's going to be pretty fun. Um, they have a computer doing it. Uh, Frederico Cuzel says they have a computer doing it. Uh, turns out checking certain data by hand leads to better results. Um, and these images are probably the ones a computer already rejected. Um, and you know what? Maybe we're training, maybe, oh my goodness, maybe we're training the AI. So like we're like telling the AI what to look for. Um, yeah, maybe that's what we're doing. I don't know. Cursor cannot be seen. It can be enabled, though. How do I enable that? Oh, I can't be bothered. Um, I guess they're out of budget to update their software, most likely, or it would throw out too many false positives. You know what I should do? I should find, like, the test people, like the NASA people or whatever, or the scientists that, like, set up this citizen science thing, and, like, I should interview them for the show. You guys think that would be interesting? We could, like, do um, this on the regular show as well for, like, people that don't watch this episode for example i think that'd be pretty neat wolf 359 is a red dwarf star located in the constellation leo near the ecliptic at a distance of approximately 7.9 light years from earth yeah it's definitely not four light years from earth that is a plot point in the um thing anybody have an idea what the clump at nine is nine Oh, yeah, that's interesting. That's really weird. Um, they did mention that some of the data in some of these um, examples is weird because they're like binary systems. And so there's a star, like, there's two stars, like, orbiting each other. And so it, like, messes with the brightness. Um, but they didn't give an example of what that looks like in the data. So some of these, like, weird shapes that we're seeing might be because of the binary systems but I don't know, which is another reason why we should interview the person from TESS to tell us all about what this, like, what is happening. Uh, sorry for the tacos. The Planet 9 Hunting 1 is just looking for bright spots in an image that could be a planet. Not hard to explain. It's cool. Oh, that's awesome. Hello, masked rocket scientist. Oh! Mask rocket scientist, I remember you from the last letting off steam, um, the one that Jamie was hosting. I was in the chat room for that. Uh, Peter Quinn, just a short ride away. Oh, I was like, what's a short ride away? Wolf 359 is a short ride away. One of the nearest stars to our sun. <laughs> I, for one, welcome our AI overlords. Yeah, me too, right? Me too. I like wish I could like figure out like how to do machine learning. Very cool. Um, don't know what I would use it for though. Also, sorry, I'm eating cheese. I got really hungry. Um, cool. Next data set. Nothing here. Next. Ooh, it's a pretty light curve. Um, these are like huge peaks, but like I, I wouldn't attribute that to like a planet. Although, I was gonna say like maybe. Maybe that, but no, nah, I don't think so. I'm going to cancel that if it lets me. Oh, God, I broke it. Let's try to get a million. I'll start. One. Oh, you're going to count up from one to a million? Are you serious? That's going to spam the chat. Don't do that. Uh, I would love an interview for Citizen Science. I have done SETI and other projects for years. Oh, Miss Mystic Wolf, that's awesome. Thank you for giving your time to the pursuit of knowledge um, for humanity. A lot of people will kind of, there are a lot of people that don't think citizen science is worth it. They're like, oh, you know, these people don't know what they're looking for, or they're not scientists, and they haven't gone to university to do a degree. Like, psh. I mean, as long as you give people good instructions, and if you don't, if, if people mess it up because your instructions are bad, that is not on them. 
that is on you as a communicator and as a scientist to like improve the way you explain things. So first off, there's that. Second off, like there are so many people around the world that, you know, have spare time on their hands and if they want to get involved and they want to help, let them help, you know, make opportunities for people to like do citizen science like this. Like, ah, people in their ivory towers. Rah, rah, rah. Lisa broke the internet. I did? How did I break the internet? Proxima Centauri, I believe, is about 4.6 light years away, but Wolf 359 is a cooler name. Uh, is it great? Oh, great username idea. Okay, Mars Rocket Scientist, if you're going to keep spamming the chat, we're going to kick you out. Sorry, like, please don't do that. Wow, sleepless. Uh, cool. All right, next, uh, next thing. Anyone see any planets here? I don't see any planets here. So I'm gonna, I mean that, maybe, maybe here, I don't know. That could be a thing. We're not gonna say it's a thing. Um, so yeah, I just wanna talk to you guys about finding cool planets and like what the Citizen Science Project is and Zooniverse.org because it has so many cool projects. Um, but if there's anything you guys wanted to talk about, like you can ask me like OBS because I learned how to use it like look I got a whole like a wait 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 there <laughs> so I have like this thing well wait, wait wait I need to go here and I need to go like this yeah there we go I have this box thing that I made <laughs> oh I'm such an amateur you would think right because like my other day job for a while was you know doing a webcast for another uh, rocket company you would think I would know how to like do, do webcasting and like do video and here I am like getting excited because I have like this thing in OBS like what like who am I such an imposter syndrome gosh tomorrow only has 55k subs you guys deserve more um <laughs> a double r o I agree I don't know why well actually I do know why we need 55k subs first of all jamie decided it would be great if we just threw away the 30k subs we already had and start a new channel that's a bad idea well a good idea but like bad for um you know growth um and second of all we got stuck into this really bad habit of being all like we are a professional news organization and we are going to tell you the news and it's going to be great and we have a chat room but we're not actually going to talk to anyone in the chat room but we have a chat room we're great and this is the news and space is great which was terrible because no one connects with that. Like, I don't, you know, like, who cares? That's what I, I could watch. I could turn my TV on and watch that news, you know? Let's do something different and new and better. Um, and so, yeah, you'll see, like, especially Orbit 11 in particular um, and kind of the end of Orbit 10, the show went through some rapid changes. Like, from week to week to week, the show would be so different and people were getting so mad at us for changing everything. But I think where we finally settled in um, by breaking out our show into like this community focused one where I talk to you in the chat room and then our regular interview shows and then like the space news that we do I think that's much better so yeah I'm glad I'm glad we did that um if you could name a planet what would you name it oh that's a great question I've never been asked that before what could I what would I name a planet oh man I don't want to be like pretentious and name it after myself, like Planet Lisa or Planet Mini Stodge. Oh, Planet Mini Stodge. What if it was a dwarf planet and I named it Planet Mini Stodge? That'd be so cute. Um, I, I don't know. I've never thought about that enough. What would you guys name a planet? Um, that is tough. It's like trying to name a child. It'd probably be easier to name a child. I already have um, names for when I finally get a husky. I really want a husky. Um, because they're so cute and fluffy and loyal and like take it for walks. Yeah. Um, I want to name it Elon Husk or Peter Bark or Pori Bruno. Those are my dog's names. Trouble Cuba, do you do any coding yourself? Um, I studied C++ in university. Um, <laughs> say that as if I'm a real coder. Uh, I did one subject I did intro to C++ but um, I came first in the class which is pretty cool I don't know why I never took it further um, I guess in my head I was like I'm gonna be a biologist I don't need coding which I ate my words when I did my first ever research project that I actually published a paper on um, December last year my paper came out 
um, because there's a program that a lot of scientists use called R and they use it for their data processing. So I had to, luckily I already had the basics of like how to code and syntax and stuff, um, but I had to learn how to code in R so I could do my data analysis. Um, and I think, you know, I had a better foot than most because I did have that basic knowledge, but um, sometimes I wonder, you know, if I had have continued up with, with coding and stuff, like where would I be now? But, you know, I actually don't stop learning. Um, I love learning new skills and I'm actually teaching myself teaching myself. I'm taking an online course for uh, Fusion 360 and learning how to CAD. Don't know what I'll do with it, but my brain was like, let's learn something new. So I was like, I'm going to learn how to CAD. Uh, so that's where I'm at right now, um, about halfway through that course. And then I'll have a certification on LinkedIn that says I know how to sort of do CAD. Uh, Peter Quinn, you guys have far too much fun uh, to be professional. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think, you know, people should be human and life is too short. You should t have fun with it. So, yeah, why not, right? If you're still getting that information across that you want to get across, if you're still getting people excited, if that's your goal, then, yeah, have fun with it. Why not? Um, the planet formerly known as Prince. Programming is fun and can be helpful in a lot of areas. Yeah, I think so too, Colton. I think so too. Python, that's good for machine learning. Uh, yeah, I guess I could try learning Python. Mm. Why not, right? Um, that is my, my goal after I finish learning how to use Fusion 360. Um, I, I would like to get back into coding. Um, and like this is like, you know, a couple months from now because I still have to write that book too um, and keep up with uh, booking guests on the show and filming Space News. Um, and I have a wedding coming up. Uh, but yeah, I want to learn how to code and I think I want to learn how to build apps, maybe, not sure. Or maybe go into like web design. I don't know. There's so many things, right? So many things. Um, 40 Eridani, abbreviated 40 ERI, also designated Omicron squared Eridani. He is a triple star system in the constellation of Eridanus. Based on parallax measurements taken during the Hipparchus mission, it is less than 17 light years from the sun. Well, that's pretty cool. Mars rocket scientists, they should eat a Mars bar when they get on Mars. Um, <laughs> Mars bars are awesome. They're Australian, right? Are they Australian? I feel like they're Australian. Or maybe I just, maybe they're just really popular in Australia, but I haven't eaten a Mars bar in Oh man, it's been so long. But it's so good. I eat a Mars bar in the weirdest way as well. Most people, you know, you open the candy and you just like eat the candy bar. That's not how I eat a Mars bar. Um, first I eat like, because it's like chocolate and then a layer of uh, caramel and a layer of, uh, of like creamy nougat stuff. So I chew, um, like I bite off the chocolate bit and I go all around the outside and I bite off the chocolate and then the top layer of chocolate, I bite that off too. And then the caramel part, I like lick off the caramel. Uh, so and then I'm left with that delicious creamy layer and then I eat that. So good thing I haven't eaten one in years because uh, that is how you um, get diabetes. Um, Mars is global. I don't get it. Mars is global? Marty the Martian? I don't know what you mean by Mars is global. Um, let's get back to planets. <laughs> Whoops. See, I'm getting so distracted talking to y'all that I'm not even... Oh, whoops. Did I just, like, skip past Trouble Cuba? There's got to be transits, right? Tips happening at regular intervals. Oops. My bad. Whoa, this data set's cool. Oh, my goodness. Look at this. But, like, I don't think it's transits because, like, the whole, the whole data set is moving rather than just, like, a dip that is different from the rest. Because that's what we're looking for. We're not just looking for, like, dips everywhere. We're looking for, like, dips that don't match the rest of the data. Which I don't think that's what this is. I'm not sure. Too ambiguous. Ooh. Is that a planet? We're going to highlight that. And maybe this one? I don't know. I'm not going to submit it yet. I want you guys to tell me what you think. 
uh, Manamess11, do I have diabetes? I do not have diabetes, um, but I do have, I'm on the borderline of like high cholesterol. Or I did have high cholesterol and it was now it's borderline. Um, which I had never had any major health issues in my life, by the way, until I moved to the United States of America. And I just ate really bad food all the time because like it's easier to eat bad food over there. Obviously, like I have choices, but when, you know, there's like 40 different kinds of fast food or, like around you in like a one mile radius, you know, it's quite easy to eat bad. But yeah, now I don't live in the US and um, yeah, I'm doing a lot better. So that's good. What are your thoughts on Virgin Orbit and air launched rockets in general? Um, I always thought Virgin Orbit was pretty cool. Um, there was a part of me that's like, oh, they're taking so long to launch by the time they get up and running, like the small sat industry is gonna be, you know, already using other launch providers anyway. But at the end of the day, the more launch providers we can have uh, to service the industry, the better because not only competition is better because, you know, it, it makes people, it, it stops monopolies like how we had for a long time with um, larger sized vehicles. Um, which means prices don't get inflated just for the sake of profit. Um, but it also means that um, people that want to send stuff into orbit have more options. So maybe one particular launch provider um, can't get you to the orbit that you need in the time that you need. And so the more options you have, the more chances you have to get into your thing into space, which is great. And satellites are changing our world. And the more sats we can have up there collecting data, the better. So the more launch providers we have, the better. Um, and so that was me in general. And then, uh, we had Will Pomerantz on this weekend and that episode has been posted. If you just go into YouTube, um, you can see that that's posted. Um, it's the newest video, uh, for tomorrow right now. Uh, he is just a fantastic communicator. He just like talks to you as a human. Um, and it just really comes through that he is excited about what that company is doing. And then that makes me excited. And, you know, some of the decisions that they've made, like the fact that they use a Boeing 747 for their, you know, air part of their launch, um, because it's a it's a jumbo jet that pretty much everyone around the world knows knows how to do the maintenance for. Um, airports are familiar with 747s, um, like that. And if you want to have, you know, a second air vehicle, you can just buy another 747, as opposed to a company like Stratolaunch where if you want to have a second giant starter launch biggest wingspan airplane in the world plane you will gotta go buy it and you could build another one because they're so rare so yeah there were some things i didn't think about with virgin orbit that made me think that their company is really freaking cool uh we have five takeaways at my local shops uh subway chinese food indian food fish and chips and greg's peter quinn you're making me hungry I have my cheese on one side and my tea on the other side and all I feel like right now is I could really go some sushi. Oh my goodness. Why am I craving sushi? Oh, yeah. I haven't had sushi in so long. Oh my god. But anyway, planets. Planets, guys, you're distracting me from the planets. Greg's the Bakers. I've not heard of Greg's the Bakers, Peter Quinn, but um, yeah, sounds cool. Uh, did we determine whether these are planets or not I don't know guys should I just submit it anyway because like someone will just check it right even if I'm wrong yeah let's just submit it it's fine cool okay what is happening here this is like an upside down planet transit are these like Australian data graphs I don't know what's going on I don't know how much longer I'm going to go. Maybe another 20 minutes? Take me to the hour? Yeah. Okay. I, I don't think this is a planet because, like, it's increasing brightness instead of decreasing. And that's, like, a 10 times increase in brightness. I, I think this is, like, fake data. Like, not fake as in simulation, but just, like, bad data. So we're not going to not gonna do that. Other than satellite TVs, and this is a question from Apple A. Welcome, Apple A. I've actually not seen you around before, before this episode, so welcome to the channel. Um, how profitable can space be outside Earth orbit? 
Uh, that depends on the technology, I think. Uh, a lot of people talk about space mining and using the resources out in, like, say, asteroids and maybe on the moon. And, yeah, I mean, if we can find a way technology-wise to bring those resources back or process them out there in space and bring, and bring the processed goods back, I think it could, could be plenty profitable. Um, my personal interest in space is about um, expanding and migrating out into the universe as a species. Um, because I just think at the end of the day, it'd be sad if we just lived on Earth forever when if we had the ability to even try to, to make settlements on, on other areas like the moon or Mars. Like, that's exciting for me. That's a great lifelong um, goal to have. And I think goal setting is really important. Like, if you live your life with no goals, um, like, and I kind of had a bit of that kind of crisis recently, like in the last, you know, six months or so longer uh six to twelve months like i didn't really have any goals to achieve because i'd achieved everything i thought i wanted in that short amount of time like for a long time i wanted to move to the u.s and then i finally made it happen and i was like living there and then i kind of just yeah i was in a bad place because i didn't have like goals to reach for anymore so i think as a species if we have a such a noble goal to just like even try to to expand out into the solar system that's just a, a really good, inspiring way to live our lives. Um, uh, I used to do the same, but within the game EVE Online, they have an engine named Project Discovery, and you can find real planets. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't play EVE Online. Can you tell me a little bit more about that game? Because it sounds spacey, and I love space things. Um... A-R-R-O, I tried to kickstart a project on Xenoverse called The Rocket Project. It kind of failed. Oh, well. Oh, tell us more about that project. Um, maybe, you know, uh, if you get it set up again, we can direct the viewers of tomorrow to go out and, and at least so we have some people um, doing the project and maybe that will help with, like, algorithms for um, Xenoverse to, like, help promote it or whatever. But, yeah. Uh, what should I 3D print? Um... You should 3D print some kind of module for a moon habitat because potentially there's a project that tomorrow we'll be doing in the future. I'm, it's, it's just in my head right now, but like imagine if we set the standards of like what the docking port would look like and then everyone around the world who had a 3D printer could design their own module, print it out, and as long as the docking port, like maybe it had to be like, th maybe it was like a, like a square of like, um, I don't know, two centimeters by two centimeters square um, and... Um, so that everyone could connect together and then we could just build that like they could print them and send them to the to the studio of tomorrow station 204 and then just like on a giant table or on the floor or I don't know we could just be sitting there and connecting up the thousands of parts that people would send us and make this giant like global um, moon base um, model that that was made from people just everyday people around the world and like we could call it like the well I don't want to call it moon village because that's like ESA's the European Space Agency's thing, but like that would be really cool, a global art project thing. Um, A -R, R O. this is my first stream with Tamari, didn't know you did streams. So we do now. I mean, well, live streams are our thing, how we started. Um, but usually the streams are um, Saturdays at 1800 uh, Coordinated Universal Time, which is like 4 a.m. Sydney time, which is why most Australians don't really know about us um, and can't participate. Hence why this stream is not at stupid o'clock Australia, New Zealand time, so that other people can participate. So I'm very glad that you're here. Um, Colton, I think comms is going to be huge. Laying down cables across the ocean and keeping them in good condition is too expensive. I agree. That's why I'm super excited for like Starlink and OneWeb and all those kind of uh, low Earth orbit internet constellations to come online. It'd be so cool. Uh, Apple A, we have to at least be able to break even to leave Earth and to explore our solar system. I mean, that depends on whether you think, and this is a conversation for another day, but this depends on whether you think uh, we need to be like locked into capitalism and the economy in order to explore. Imagine if there was like a way where you could just like grow food super easy so that nobody had to worry about buying food because you were just always provided for um and if your shelter was your spacecraft and 
like you could be self-sufficient then why do you need capitalism but that's a star trek future that we quite haven't yet reached so we'll get there um if there are any caves on the moon or other planets we should use them says peter quinn um yeah awesome i think so too i mean if you're in a cave on the moon then you have that extra layer of radiation protection um i think that's really cool you also have protection from like um impacts from like you know space rock kevin mccoy oh kevin mccoy hello kevin mccoy good to see you here um your moon habitat 3d printing project makes me think of the great ball contraption where people make lego machines that move balls that can integrate with anyone else's because of size standards yeah, um, I kind of springboarded that idea off, um, I'd seen someone at a museum, um, there was this giant room, I think it was Tate Modern, I think Tate Modern, but don't quote me, um, a giant room, white, full of just white tables and white Lego, and people would just, like, build, um, a city or buildings, um, like, out of Legos, and it would change every day because people, like, things would fall over by accident or by purpose, uh, and then people just would just reconstruct and so it was like this living breathing um architectural project um that was uh, but also an art project just made from whatever people's creativity decided to be on the day that they walked through that building really cool so i'd, I'd love to do something similar but kind of instead of being a city um being space related so or a space city or a space habitat that'd be so cool um, Peter Quinn says it's 7 p.m. UK on Saturday. Oh, that's the regular show, 7 p.m. UK Saturday. Or technically 1800 coordinated universal time because then we don't have to worry about daylight savings and all those shenanigans. Uh, A-double-R-O, the rocket project was a project to make the general public aware of how after the space race there was a massive gap in progress in aerospace engineering, specifically I ISS ferrying. Uh, the physicist. Is it possible to get employed at yours as a German physicist? You mean employed at tomorrow? Uh, we we don't really have a need for physicists in terms of doing physics stuff. Uh, but I mean, if there are any skills you think you can contribute, you can head to our community forums, uh, community.tmro.tv, or you can leave a comment um, below, or you can email us. Um, you can either email Jamie or myself for jamie at tomorrow.tv or lisa at tomorrow.tv. Um, yeah, I, I don't really see a need for a, like a physicist in the near future. Definitely we need like people with like coding experience and like um, animation, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. It'd be cool to have a physicist on set though. <laughs> like kind of like an e expert in the audience like we, we say something stupid like completely stupid and wrong and then the physicist just like buzzes in and it's like you guys are wrong the earth is actually round like yeah that would be kind of funny next data set oh sorry yeah i got i got distracted sorry uh don't see any planets here like you could probably think that like this one at like 25 and uh, 17 could maybe be one, but like it's not, it's not super clear. So we're just gonna click done. Same with this one. Nothing super sticky out. That's a scientific term, sticky out. Apple A. I don't believe in slave labor to build spaceships against people's will, like the pyramids were built. Um, neither do I. I don't think we should force people to do anything they don't want. But if you know people are interested and want to contribute their expertise like you know for example maybe you're a plumber but you also like space if you want to come and maintain the plumbing on our um spaceship yeah cool like come and do it or even better maybe you're a plumber who programs robots to do the plumbing work for you um that would be awesome come on board you know we've got unlimited food that we can like grow really easily with our automated like food systems come on board let's go explore the universe and you can take care of all the plumbing that's the kind of, you know, ideal vision that I have for how we would explore the cosmos. But yeah, 
still just a big one. We need to get really good at growing food both on Earth and in space. And once we um, have the ability to grow food, distribute it, and, and store it in a way so that no one really has to go hungry, um, I think our you know overall ability as a species to be to progress and and discover new things is going to become exponential, right? Because then everybody can reach their full potential. Nobody has to expend time just trying to put food in their mouths and feed their empty stomachs. What would you consider the greatest threat against space travel or the space industry in the near future? Um, the greatest threat? Oh my goodness. Ah, ah, political instability is probably a big one and war. Um, if for some reason, you know, we as a species end up squabbling over something really, um, well, I don't want to say really something really stupid because sometimes we do go to war for you know, sort of the right reasons. Um, wars are expensive and they take a lot of resources. And so, you know, if half the country and uh, half the country, if half the planet ends up, you know, fighting each other in war, then who's going to be left to like do like science and engineering and, and research and that kind of stuff. So I don't like war. Uh, you know, I don't wish war on anybody. Um, and yeah, it's just, just bad for societal progress. Uh, Colton, we meet, may need more of those people since hosts can't have the iPads in the interviews. <laughs> you have more of an expert audience? Yeah, probably. Uh, A-double-R-O, do you think there are enough science communicators on YouTube? Um, do I think there are enough science communicators on YouTube? That is a tough question because I think there are, but I think a lot of people focus on the same kinds of science. So a lot of people talk about like engineering and uh, physics things and like astronomy and dark matter. There are so many like astronomy um, science communicators, um, especially like in traditional media as well. A lot of the, like if you think about the famous scientists out there, a lot of them are um, astronomers, which nothing against astronomers. That's awesome. Good on you. But like, Where's the, where's the, where's the diversity in science there? Like, because one thing the media is really bad at, traditional media, sorry, is like, say you have astronomer, an astronomer that um, comes and visits your set to, to be your science expert. Um, and you're talking, you know, you're doing a story about exoplanets. Cool, fantastic. They can answer those questions. And then you turn around and you do a question about SpaceX. And that astronomer, and I'm totally not referring to anyone in Australia, um, and, and to be fair, a lot of people that I've seen this happen to actually tend to do a really good job um, at answering the question within their means. But like <laughs> to have someone who like specializes in like dark matter or something answering a question on like, why did SpaceX choose to build their starship out of um, stainless steel instead of carbon fiber, Mr. or Mrs. Uh, person astronomer? Like, I'm just like, how did, it, oh, forehead slap, like, that's not their area of expertise or one scientist can't know everything like people are are experts in, in different parts of science and that, and that doesn't mean that you can ask them a question about like ocean biology and that the astronomer is going to know about it like and and most of the time they do a good job they're like you know that's not my area but maybe this could be why but just like come on come on media do better do better get actual experts on that work in that area like that's what we try and do like you know, the last STEAM episode we had, we were talking about oceans and building boats and stuff. And I didn't like turn around and ask you know, the guest, Julie, like, what do you think about um, forest fires in the Amazon? Like, you just, come on, come on, media, do better. This is my official throwdown to the traditional media to do better with how they communicate science. And they're welcome to get me to consult with them if they want to. That's the service that tomorrow offers. Um... But back to the original question, because I totally tangented there. Do I think there are enough science communicators on YouTube? Um, I think that certain areas of science are saturated with science communicators on YouTube, but there um, should always be more. If people, if that's what people want to do, if people want to talk about science and do it on, on the internet, go for it. Like, I'm never going to say there's too many and don't do it, because why? Like, just do, do what you like, do what makes you happy. Um, I think the big threat for the industry is funding. 
yeah, I can probably agree with that, um, which is why, like, you know, if wars happen, that's going to take a lot of money and that funding will go away from, like, space research and, and building cool space stuff. <laughs> a double R O. Yeah, remember Stargazing Live on ABC? They had astronomers talk about rocket science. Pretty funny. I may have been referencing <laughs> some of that, to be honest. There are just... <laughs> I don't want to mention names, but like there, there are a few regular um, astronomers that go on uh, on TV, and like like I said, they do the best with with what they have, um, and they do answer those questions. Like they do put those caveats of like you know I'm an I'm an astronomer, I don't know about rockets. Like they do that pretty well, um, and sometimes you know for the level of what the media wants, they just want that high level overview of like yeah cool. Starship can lift more mass than any other rocket so far, and that means we can like have lower costs of spaceflight, and that's better for everyone. Like those kind of high level conversations. All right, like I get that, and you know the media are pretty risky, especially when it, uh, risk averse when it comes to um, you know like live television, live breakfast shows, and whatever. Like they don't want to put someone new on because they don't know whether they're going to freak out on camera, or whether they're going to feel natural on camera. So once they find a science expert that they know is good on camera, they tend to stick to them because they don't like taking risks. Um, but, you know, maybe look on YouTube for, like, successful um, science communicators that are good on camera, and if they happen to line up their expertise with what you're looking for, maybe get them on. So you can reduce your risk by getting people who already talk to cameras on an everyday basis on like YouTube and stuff. So that totally wasn't a, like a subtle hint for like channel seven and 10 and channel nine in Australia to like call me and be like, come on TV. Um, but I wouldn't say no. Uh, particle physics is the best uh, with Astro, of course, says the physicist. Um, I'm glad that then a physicist says that a type of physics is their favorite science because otherwise I'd be confused. Oh, Tandem1221 has an interesting point. Uh, fanboying SpaceX is kind of cringy sometimes as unnecessary fanboying. I would say that some people can get quite um, emotional and quite intense with their love of SpaceX. And sometimes that does go, you know, a little bit uh, overboard. I can understand why, because the stuff that SpaceX is doing, you know, they just don't care. They just be like, you know what, we want to do this, and yeah, so what if no one else hasn't done it before? We're still going to try. And that's really inspiring and motivating. Um, and it's good to have that kind of passion about things. As long as you're not hurting other people or, you know, annoying other people, I think, you know, do what you want. Um, for me, uh, yeah, I would say I'm a SpaceX fan. Um, definitely a bit of a fangirl, but... I'm also a space industry fan girl, and so I, I, you know, I support all companies that are doing cool stuff in space. You know, SpaceX is awesome. Rocket Lab is awesome. This weekend, I got even more in like feeling that uh, Virgin Orbit is awesome. So, yeah, people doing cool stuff in space. I'm gonna support you because I think space is just amazing, and uh, any way I can support the companies doing that, uh, I'm gonna do it. Gonna join you on Planet Hunters now, Planet Hunting Buddies. Planet Hunting Buddies, yeah, Trouble Cuba, good on you. I don't find, uh, uh, Peter Quinn, sorry, I had to like read that probably. Peter Quinn, I don't find discussing rocket science, science anymore. Um, I don't think I understand what you mean. Oh, excuse me. Uh, Peter Quinn, we need more astronomy on TV. Uh, yeah. As in, like, do you mean, like, we should have more astronomy in terms of, like, having a series like Cosmos or something come back? That would be cool. Uh, A-double-R-O, I saw Brian live. It was a great experience. Um, I have not seen Brian Cox live. That would be pretty cool. Loopy! Loopy's here! Hi, Loopy! Um, Loopy, you just joined us. We're looking for planets, although I keep getting distracted by the chat room, so I'm sorry. Um, we're looking for, like, dips in the data here. Um, like, something like this, except, like, more pronounced. Because this data, the main body of data is kind of just dispersed everywhere. It's not very clear. 
So I'm not going to mark that as a final, but hopefully we'll get a good example here to show you. This one is not a good example. I'm going to click next again. Neither is this one. Let's go next. <laughs> yeah, I think we got jinxed. None of these are very good candidates. Nope. We're just going to keep going till we find a good one. All right, here we go. Loopy, welcome to the instant tutorial. Um, this is a daughter of, uh, you may, my, probably already know this anyway, so this might be like totally waste of my time. Um, we're looking at uh, these dots are a measure of the brightness of a star really far away from us. Um, and as a planet potentially goes in front of that star, the, the overall brightness is going to dim and it's going to look like a tiny like drop in the brightness here. So we're going to highlight that and be like, hello, potential planet, planet Lisa, or planet tomorrow, the planet of tomorrow. That's what we're going to call it. Um, go Seki, New Zealand. Oh, Seki. Hi, Seki. Um, he was here in New Zealand while you were in the US, Lisa. Oh, dang it. I always tend to be in the wrong country at the wrong time. Like, I had this, like, $300 US ticket that I bought, like, when I had a really good paying job. <laughs> oh, those were the days. Um, to go and see one of my favorite artists, John Bellion, in Los Angeles. And it was like front row in the middle. I was so excited. I was so, so excited to see this guy live. And then I had to fly back to Australia right when the concert was going to be. And I missed it. And I couldn't even give my ticket away. Like no one would buy it. And then no one would take it for free. And it just got wasted. And like I'm still salty about that. Uh, oh, this is a crowdsourced science thing. Like what Cosmo Quest did in partnership with the OSIRIS-REx mission. Yeah, Loopy, exactly. Um, a, a crowdsourced citizen science. Um, I'm just going to mark some planets here. Uh, I think this one here, here. Here, here, and here, maybe. Oh, I don't know, we'll see. Um, oh, yeah, I got it right. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so the CosmoQuest X one was looking at uh, the photos of the surface of the asteroid Bennu, where the OSIRIS-REx uh, mission is at the moment. Wait, Bennu? Is Bennu OSIRIS-REx? I keep getting mixed up with Hayabusa and OSIRIS-REx. No, Hayabusa 2 is orbiting Ryugu and OSIRIS-REx is orbiting Bennu. Okay. Um, yeah, so I participated in that one too, which was like very tedious. You'd have to go and like click every single like boulder and stuff. Um, uh, A-double-R-O, he's a great public speaker, very enthusiastic. Oh, huh. awesome. Oh, we're talking about Brian Cox. Uh, yeah, never seen him, and, uh, I, I would like to. It's pretty cool. I saw Alan Older, the guy from MASH. Um, I saw him do a talk once. He runs a science communication institute now. He's really cool. Um, oh, I should get him on the show. Oh my goodness, I should get Alan Older from MASH on the show. Oh man, I have this list of all these amazing people now. Uh, any more planets here? That could be a planet maybe. There and there and there. But like, I'm not sure. I'm just going to say no. Cool. <laughs> Alright, like maybe 10 more minutes because I am getting sleepy. But also like, I have nothing else planned for the rest of my night. So I guess I'll keep streaming until I get tired. Um, do you think this is a planet? I don't know. Maybe not. I don't think that's a planet. I'm just like so proud. Can I just like take a second to say how proud I am of like working out how to do OBS? Like, oh, I'm just so proud of my OBS skills now. Next minute you see me like become a famous Twitch streamer. I do play games, um, although not as much as I used to. I got really, really addicted to games when I was like at university. Um, so I tend not to game so much these days because it, it's very easy for me to switch back into that um, almost addiction mode where I like spend my whole day gaming. So I try to limit my exposure to not, um, you know, just to not have that temptation. Uh, Tandem 1221 says, what does empty spaces on the diagram mean? So uh, some of this data gets a little bit messed up because uh, every now and then uh, the test, the, the, um, 
excuse me, the spacecraft has uh, like, you know, giant hard drives inside to save all this data. And then eventually, you know, they're going to get full. So it needs to transmit the data back to Earth so that it can like start recording um, again. And so to do that, it needs to keep its antenna like pointed uh, directly at Earth, uh, which means that the telescope part, um, you know, might not be exactly in the right spot for that particular place that it's looking at, um, or it might not be able to keep it, you know, pointed uh, well. So that kind of data um, from that time when it's transmitting back to Earth is a little bit kind of messed up. So to make this nice and clear for us to help hunt the patterns, um, they just uh, cut that data away so that it doesn't distract us. Ah, exactly what Colton said in the chat room. Um, Alex Carlton says, FYI, a guy in Volga's universe, this, this platform we're using today, um, just tweeted out asking for help with the Dorian disaster as they have set up a thing looking for landing sites. Oh, okay, well, um, yeah, uh, next LOS stream, let's do that. Let's, uh, that's, that's science, right? Like we're analyzing images and getting data. That's, that's what science is all about. Uh, finding conclusions from that data. So, you know, we're helping people find landing sites. That counts as science. So that's totally fine to do for a letting off steam episode. Yeah, we might do that for our next one. Um, thanks. Thanks for letting us know, Alex Carlton. Uh, A double R O, do I play KSP? <laughs> do I play KSP? How do I answer that? I have intentionally avoided buying KSP or even using the demo um, because I know that if I get KSP I am going to spend so much time on it that tomorrow we'll never have any guests lined up for their shows because I will just not be working I will just simply be playing KSP all the time so I've played the demo and so I know you know I know the basic premise of the game I have a feel for the mechanics. I've watched other people play KSP, like Scott Manley and Everyday Astronaut, um, but I do not have KSP and I do not play KSP because I don't want to get addicted to games again. Um, usually these days I play Stardew Valley and um, Don't Starve. In, uh, oh, Don't Starve I usually play uh, with friends, like, and then we just like chat over like Skype and stuff because I find that kind of like interactive multiplayer-ness to be really fun. So yeah, that's what I play. Uh, wow, currently 250 hours on KSP, A double R O. Oh my goodness, you must be an expert. That's crazy. Wow. Um, yeah, I used to play, <laughs> oh man, back in the day, way back in the day, I used to love playing Guitar Hero. Uh, like if we're talking like traditional gaming. Um, I used to play Guitar Hero and I used to get, I was so good with Guitar Hero, oh sorry I need to also be doing some science hey, uh, I was so good with Guitar Hero that I, uh, I learned how to play one particular song with my feet, <laughs> I know that sounds really weird but um, yeah, literally like one of, one of my feet would do the strumming bit and the other, kind of my, like my other foot would like press the buttons, um, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm weird. Uh, then I, you know, upgraded to, I uh, played a lot of Skyrim and I played a lot of Fallout 3. Um, like hours upon hours upon hours. I love Skyrim so much. Um, I had to stop because I started developing, um, really bad, like, phobia, anxiety towards, like, the spiders in the game. To, like, the point where I was having nightmares and couldn't sleep. Um, so I had to stop playing those games which was pretty sucky, to be honest. But, I mean, also a good thing because, okay, what is happening with this data? I would usually classify that as a planet, except, like, now it's going up here, and so I'm like, I don't think that's a planet. I think that's just weird data. Uh, Colton just downloaded the latest version of KSP. Nice. Loopy has got over 3,000 hours. Oh, my goodness, that's awesome. Colton, ooh, you use Skype? Set up your own Discord, Discord server. Um, I mean, I could, but then I'd have to show my friend how to do that, and that takes time away from the actual gaming. So, you know, there's that. 
this is easier to use Skype because my friends know how to use it. Uh, Loopy, stream that for the next LOS. Wait, stream what for the next LOS? Playing games? Wait. Or playing Guitar Hero with my feet. <laughs> Which I can't do because I don't have Guitar Hero anymore. Like, And it was like back in the PlayStation 2. I'm showing my age, right? <laughs> Uh, Loopy, once I get chat done and Lisa starts finding customers to use it. Oh, I didn't know that was one of my jobs, but all right, cool. <laughs> um, we will need more admin stuff to be done, and that will most likely be coming out of my pocket. Um, I mean, Colton, as we grow our Patreon and stuff, like the amount of our budget that can go towards chat things, including admin, can also expand. So like that, that could be a thing. Uh, Darko, good night. Thank you for joining me. Um, <laughs> uh, go have fun designing something on Fusion 360. Um, I, I also know how that program works now, so that's awesome. Uh, yeah, hopefully we get this idea to like have everybody 3D. Oh, excuse me, man, I, like tea just keeps like making me burp. It's so bad. Uh, yeah, so hopefully we'll have this like design thing happen where everyone can like print a part of a moon base and we all join them together and like live stream it that'd be so cool but um that is like in its complete infancy it's literally an idea that like myself and like jamie have so uh it might have to wait till i'm like back in the u.s for me to organize logistics and stuff of it um and some of this stuff is slow going because i just have to like find the time to do it especially like while i'm trying to like find myself a job to like be able to have food <laughs> so yeah <laughs> Um, but it, it sounds like a lot of fun and we, we think it's a good idea and like everyone can get involved. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Peter Quinn is hooked on The Sims 3, even built my own house. I used to play Sims so much back in the day. I've never played Sims 3, but um, Sims 1 and Sims 2 um, and uh, like a bunch of expansion packs. Yeah, I used to do a lot of that too. Oh, yeah. Neopets? Did anyone ever play Neopets? I used to play Neopets so much back in like early 2000s like 2002 like 2003 2004 kind of time frame neopets was the bomb oh love neopets i feel really old right now uh colton says jamie said you might have some ideas on who to take it to uh is that what she said because i i don't remember oh you know we could probably like push the chat product out to like conferences and stuff like actual like business conferences like not just space conferences so yeah maybe there's there's customers there time for me to move into my new role in tomorrow business development <laughs> oh i just i just do all the jobs tomorrow it's fine producer sure guest and relationship manager sure business development sure human resources sure i do it all yeah, Colton, it would be cool. I mean, I think your chat product is amazing. Uh, Loopy wanted to, as a kid, uh, ended up on Webkins instead. I don't know what Webkins is. Uh, A-double-R-O, where were you in the latest Tomorrow video when you were talking about rocketry in Australia and ESA. Um, I'm here where I was now. I wasn't exactly in this spot in this chair, but I was like just, um, there's, a, there's a yard just like outside here. Um, I was in the yard. That's where I, this is where I live now, in the middle of like literal, literal like mountains and greenery and stuff. It's so different to Los Angeles. Like it's so much happier. I didn't realize like how much I didn't like, like living in a concrete jungle until like I came to New Zealand. Where are all the planets, guys? I've not been able to mark a planet in so long. I feel like I'm missing out. Come on, universe. Why so few planets around the stars? Like, every planet should have a star that we can observe through test data. Oh, do you think this is a planet? This could be a planet. I think this is a planet. Maybe? Uh, I'm going to say yes. You know what? I'm, I'm doing it. Planet. It's done. Loopy. I mean, all of those seem like they fit under the main umbrella of producer. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Um, yeah, we have some pretty, pretty wide definition of producer. At its core, it just means get the show done, right? So you got to do what you got to do. Uh, 
uh, Webkins was like you bought a plush from a store and it came with a code to plug into an online game. Ooh, that sounds like fun. Ooh, ooh, planet, planet. Is that a planet? And that, that's a planet? Oh, guys, we found a planet. Oh, yeah, we did it. No planets here. Uh, any planets? That could maybe be a planet. And then over here as well, maybe. Am I just wishful thinking this? I feel like a lot of this is wishful thinking. Um, Kevin McCoy. K McCoy. I moved to San Francisco at the beginning of this year and for the first time I'm living in a concrete jungle and oh boy do I realise that on three occasions I get to go out and see trees and stuff. Yeah, I think a lot of the reason I was like so um, unhappy with living in Los Angeles was not that it was a concrete jungle but because I didn't have my own car. Like... I used to just like rent vehicles on tour for months at a time, which by the way is really expensive. Um, and yeah, like, so I tried to like limit my car usage, but then to like get from Los Angeles to like not concrete jungle, like you need a car that it's not like a bus that's going to like take you to like nature without being like a, I don't know, four hour trip one way. So yeah, I definitely should have bought a car. But, you know, when you first move to the US, you don't have a credit history, and so therefore you don't have a credit score, and therefore nobody will give you money to be able to buy a car. So I ran into that um, problem as well. But it's now a year on from the first time I moved to the US, and uh, I have a credit score that is deemed excellent now, and I'm very proud of that. So, yeah, I'm just telling you because I'm proud of it, and I want to share that news. Uh, Marty the Martian, every planet should have a star. Do you mean every star should have a planet? Yeah, that's what I meant. Sorry, I got a bit excited. Uh, uh, AWRO asks, have you been to an actual rocket launch? I mean, I've been to my own, but it's not nearly as impressive as a SpaceX or ULA launch. Uh, do you mean, are you comparing the going to a rocket launch experience as compared to, say, um, like the webcast views that you can get uh, because uh, I think a hybrid is the best of both worlds, right? Like imagine if you're out like at a beach or whatever, like watching either a rocket lab launch or a SpaceX launch or whatever. Um, but then like you also have the ability to like pull up the stream on your phone because you're going to get the best HD views and the close up views and like all of those angles, like on the official webcast itself. But then like you actually being there gives you that human connection to the rocket. So like that's what I did when I saw the Electron launch. I had the stream up and like I was um, like looking at the launch site and yeah, like it was just, it was really cool to be like, oh, that's it, it's like happening. Well, actually, I wasn't really looking at that and I was too busy looking at the rocket, which I, uh, you should do that. You should, you can always go and rewatch the webcast later, which is what I did. So I throw the phone away and like look at the actual launch. Like that's really cool. Um... Rogue planets. Now we're talking about rogue planets. Ooh, rogue planets. Interstellar planet, nomad planet. Oh, nomad planet. That's the kind of planet I would like to go to because I feel like I am a nomad. I, like, move countries, like, every, like, year, which, by the way, is quite logistically challenging. So now I only have, like, two suitcases worth of belongings and it makes my life a whole lot easier. I don't see any planets here. Oh, 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 planet, 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 planet. Uh, maybe. Is that a planet? Oh, guys, I don't know. I don't know anymore. This, this citizen science makes me doubt myself. Uh, Loopy says, that's what a lot of people do. When I was at Cocoa Beach Pier, I heard a lot of people's phones had the ULA stream. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um... You would think in the middle of New Zealand, uh, on the East Coast, where <laughs> like the cell service is not that great, um, and I talk about that in the video that I'm going to be doing and when I'm going to release it, uh, well, who knows when I'm going to release it, but um, yeah, basically anywhere you go uh, around New Zealand near the launch site, near Mahia, doesn't have great cell service. But, tip here, like a spoiler from the video, there is like a, a rest stop that's about 20 minutes outside of Mahia, back on the coastline. And all it has is like literally like it has two restrooms um, and 
like a light so you can see the restrooms in the dark and just like a parking area and a trash can um and it has free wi-fi what what middle of nowhere it doesn't even have running water has two like drop toilets um and like wi-fi like what so that's how i was able to get the rocket line webcast up while i was like watching the launch and it was really cool um i would have streamed from there but um like it was enough to watch a webcast but not really enough to have a like half decent stream unless i was like streaming in like 360p which i could probably do but like what's the point unless i was doing like a tim dodd type um commentary type thing but from there to watch a launch from there to watch a launch like you don't want to watch me watching the launch what you could just watch the webcast on your own you know uh oh i need to catch up with the chat room sorry uh, Colton says, my first launch will hopefully be a crewed starship. I may not be able to get out much, but if I miss that, I will hate myself. Oh, man, Colton, me too. Like, and I, I really want to watch Starship. I want to watch DM, um, I nearly said DM1. That's already happened. I want to watch DM2. Like, I want to watch the first, um, like, SpaceX Mission 1. Um, I want to watch, uh, even watching SLS um, first mission would be really cool. Um, but, like, Falcon Heavy, I really want to see a Falcon Heavy. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping, hoping, hoping. That I will be able to afford when, when I'm back in the US in um, like November, December. I'm coming back for Thanksgiving. I really, really hope I can like make a trip to Florida, even if it's really quick, and like see a launch because, oh man, Falcon Heavy. Just, oh, I love Falcon Heavy so much. <laughs> Marty the Martian. Um, who needs running water when you have running internet? <laughs> Oh, truth, right? Like priorities. You could just bring bottles of water in your car, right? So, you know, as long as you're prepared, you're fine. But the internet, like that needs to be provided by by the location. Unless Starlink. Oh, man, imagine when Starlink's operational and like you can just like get good internet anywhere and you can stream anything. That's going to be when it's going to be a great time to be a YouTuber. Uh, Darko. Push on with the Fusion 360. It's great, fun, and useful. I do uh, remote control aircraft modeling. Oh, that's awesome, Darko. That's a really cool, neat uh, hobby to do. You recently made, made plugs for kitchen chairs, and uh, your wife commented, finally something useful from your toys. It's good for family harmony. Yeah, I'm hoping that the um, that the studio of tomorrow, sorry, Station 204, um, invests in a 3D printer, mostly because I want to mess around with it and learn how to use them. Um, ooh, do you guys think that maybe this is a planet, and this is a planet, and this is a planet, and maybe that, and, ooh, yeah, yeah, I think we found planets, guys. Oh, well, maybe not, maybe not. Oh, I don't know, I know, I'm indecisive. I don't know. Okay, not that way, and not that way. Yeah, we'll just go with those. Sorry, I got distracted again. Um, Colton, that's how tomorrow got started. We loved watching launches with Jamie. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. But at the time, the launches, like the webcasts were boring. So like watching them with Jamie got you excited because like there was a human element provided for the webcast. But now like SpaceX and Rocket Lab and New LA and Blue Origin, do a pretty good job at you know putting at least some kind of humanness into the rocket launch and then if not then you've got tim dodd and doing that kind of stuff so i guess it's just a matter of figuring out uh what the what the benefit is what what you would add to it by you know restreaming it and talking about it uh, any planets here i don't think so dave robert hi lisa from oz one and a half hours late well welcome thanks for joining us to have you here um we are looking for stars um this data that you can see here the white spots uh, data set uh it's information from nasa's um test transiting exoplanet survey satellite uh, that is a, a space telescope that looks at stars um and measures their brightness basically and just repeatedly every few days or whatever um monitors their brightness and then uh, what we're looking for is if there's a planet orbiting around that star, sometimes the planet will pass in between the star and Tess, 
and that will lead to like a dip um, in the brightness uh, in the graph that you can see here. Um, this particular one doesn't seem to have a planet because the dot is just everywhere. Um, it's much more clear in like other examples. The thing is with Falcon Heavy, not only do you get to have a launch experience, but also dual landing. <laughs> and a crash center core unless the curse discontinues. Um, yeah, that's also like, that's why I want to see, um, even if like single stick Falcon 9 would be cool. I have seen a Falcon 9 launch, um, except it was from LAX airport for a Vandenberg launch. <laughs> Everyone in the airport was looking at me because I was like literally screaming and cheering and being like, oh my god, oh my god, because like you could see... You could see stage set, you could see the boost back burn, you could see it coming down for landing, like that was so cool. And like you could still see the second stage going while like the first stage coming back. Oh, that was so exciting. But like all these people waiting for their flight were just like looking at their phone and look out the window, there's a spaceship. Like people that don't get excited about space, I just don't understand. I know we all like different things. Um, but to be able to like be actually closer and actually at like the the launch and landing areas or close by would be so cool. Um, those dips before the peak sure looks like a planet. Oh, whoops, sorry Colton. <laughs> I already skipped it. Uh, Lisa discovers a Dyson sphere. That would be cool. <laughs> Jeff who? <laughs> Uh, Lob, Lo, Lou Ob, Lob, Lob? I don't know how to pronounce your username, I'm sorry. Uh, A-double-R-O says, is Zooniverse an Australian website? I don't, I don't know why I think that. Um, I do not know whether Zooniverse is Australian. Whoever made it though, like, good on them. It's a really good platform with all different kinds of, uh, you know, space and science communication kind of stuff. So that's awesome. Um, I really wanted to do the penguin one, but I couldn't find it the other day. Um, just because penguins. Who doesn't love penguins? They're so cute. And they like walk like this, and then but they smell like fish. But that's okay, because, you know, they can't help it. Wow, this is an interesting star. But um, I don't think there's any planets. If you get down to Florida, I've got plenty of tips on things to see and places you could watch from. That'd be awesome, Loopy. I'd love to do that. Any planets here? No. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Here's some planets. We're going to call that planet Elon Husk, planet Peter Bark, planet Pori Bruno. Um, guys, I need your help. I need another husky dog space CEO related name. Um, <laughs> Jeff Awu. <laughs> No, wait, that doesn't work. Oh, 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 I think I'm getting tired. I'm not even making sense anymore. Oh, oh, oh that was so stupid. Oh. Awu origin. That's what I should have said. <laughs> oh, my goodness, guys. I should probably go soon. Oh, Chris... Lintot from Britain made the site. So shout out to Chris Lintot. Um, thanks, Colton. Um, <laughs> loopy. Jeff Barksos. <laughs> oh, I'm getting delirious with dog names related to space. All right. Okay. Guys, I've been on the air for two hours. I think I'm going to wrap this up. Um, thanks for joining me. Hopefully you're playing along too, looking for planets with me. Um, that was really fun. I hope we actually found some planets. Maybe we can get the uh, citizens of tomorrow, like, if they contact us and they're like, you found a planet, I'll be like, don't put my name, put the citizens of tomorrow. And then all of you, by, like, helping the show and watching the show and talking with us, um, you know, a little way to give back is that we all found a planet together. So that'd be pretty neat. Yeah, I'm going to go. I'm tired. My tea has gone cold. My cat is meowing, trying to get outside. So, um... Yeah, <laughs> let off a little too much steam. <laughs> Husky luck. Oh, okay, I really appreciate you guys uh, just sitting here chatting with me and you know, hopefully we did some science and hopefully you had fun and let's, uh, let's get excited for the next one. So make sure you subscribe, make sure you hit the bell 
so you know when I'm streaming or when any of us are streaming and until next time I have to remember how to turn the stream off in OBS uh stop streaming yeah that one okay bye